Continuing on with the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are very pleased to present Michelle Henry. Michelle has served as the Chautauqua County New York Historian Records Management Coordinator since 2000. She earned a BA in Anthropology from Penn State, an MA in Anthropology, and a Graduate Certificate in Museum Studies from the Arizona State. Uh, since implementing an archival records program for the county, uh, she has managed numerous state and federal grants to preserve historical records and to make them more accessible. Uh, Michelle is certified as a New York State Registered Historian, received the 2010 Wheeler B. Mil Milanus Award for Outstanding Service to Records Management in New York State, and the 2011 Julia Reinstein Historian Award for Excellence. Uh, for today's presentation, Michelle will give a brief history of the Chautauqua County uh, in the opening of Western New York for settlement in the late 1700s. Uh, Michelle will discuss the records at the county archives that are available for genealogical research and also the resources that are available on their website as county historian. So I would like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Michelle. Thank you very much. And welcome to New York State. Um, I will just mention since uh, the instructor, the word of the day is double cousin that my dad's father married my mom's mother. And so I have spent my whole life talking about my double cousins. And um, so it was fun to hear that as your word of the day. So um, we are in Chautauqua County. And for those of you who might not be familiar with New York State, I thought it would help to just start out by showing you a map of exactly where we are, because there are a lot of people in New York State who have no idea where Chautauqua County is. And um, they often seem confused when we tell them that we're west of Buffalo because most folks don't think you can go farther west than Buffalo in New York State. But that is us. We are bordered on two sides by the state of Pennsylvania and on the north by Lake Erie. So we really only touch New York State on one side. So um, our area of New York State, I'll just show you this other map to kind of give you scale. Um, I actually can drive to Detroit, Michigan quicker than I can drive to Albany, our capital. So we really have more of a Midwestern uh, flavor here, I think. And our development was really strongly tied to the Great Lakes, more so than the Erie Canal because the Erie Canal didn't come to Chautauqua County. So for us, our early history really is um, very much tied to St. Lawrence Seaway and the Great Lakes. Um, so around the time of the Revolutionary War and after the Revolutionary War, we still had not been opened for settlement. There was a lot of confusion about um, who actually owned Western New York, which included Chautauqua County. Um, there were some Indian treaties that were a little nebulous and nobody was real sure exactly which land and where those territorial lines were. So we really weren't able to be settled. Um, after the Revolutionary War, the federal government was broke, the state government was broke, and they were looking for ways to get cash or capital. And so um, some treaties were finalized with the Native Americans here and all of Western New York and some of Pennsylvania were sold to a company of men in Holland, in the country of Holland, that were known as the Holland Land Company. And they basically bought millions and millions of acres of land in Western New York, in Pennsylvania, um, with the sole purpose of getting those open for settlement to get a return on their investment. So our early settlers came down the Great Lakes or they came up the um, Hudson River Valley and over across New York State that way. But our primary, it was easiest to get here by coming down the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Great Lakes. And so um, the Holland Land Company by the end of the 1700s had secured all of this land and they sent surveying companies out here. And the surveyors, here's just a little um, screenshot of one of the early histories of the land purchase. It's sometimes called the Holland Purchase. Um, we always refer to it as the Holland Land Company. Um, 
all of the early deeds, every deed still in Chautauqua County eventually is going to come out of a Holland Land Company um, lot because they owned the whole area. So what the surveyors did is they divided Chautauqua County into um, a grid and most of the counties in Western New York are the same way. And so all of the early property descriptions are by this township and range scenario. And each of these grids is about six miles square. And that was because that was about how far you could expect a person to be able to travel in one day to conduct business. And so each of these grids basically became a town as the county's population grew. And so now many of these grids are our towns, but early on they were just designations of lots for sale. And then with each, within each one of these towns, this is one of those towns, there was an even smaller grid system and these are the great lots. So I don't know, you know, this might seem like a lot of information, but if anybody's going to research Chautauqua County history, all of our deeds, even today, still reference the Holland Land Company lot, township, and range. And by having a map that shows these grids, you can narrow down the location of any piece of property um, within one of these great lots. So we use these maps all the time today still, and researchers, they're, they're posted all over the uh, courthouse, the clerk's office, because they're still referenced all the time. So this is how our first settlers would have come in. Um, the first land contract that we have was in 1802. So, uh, you know, Eastern New York State um, has records going back into the 1600s, 1700s. Um, we were the Wild West. We were the frontier of the country after the Revolutionary War. So when Horace Greeley so famously said, go west, young man, he was actually referring to the wilds of Western New York and Ohio and Pennsylvania. Uh, Horace Greeley actually um, lived here for a period of time. So he was kind of instrumental in some of our early political history. So, um, so we don't have a lot of records from that time period because we basically didn't have enough of a population to, um, to compile them. So our first land contract was 1802. Um, the first settlers came in in that decade. Um, we had 500 taxable inhabitants by 1811, and that's when the county was officially recognized as a political entity, as a, as a, a county government. So, you know, a taxable inhabitant at that time meant uh, a man um, because a woman really couldn't own land and um, you had to be eligible to vote and to be eligible to vote, you had to own land. So that is how New York State determined when a county was ready to be cut off from um, adjacent counties and function independently. So our first records begin in 1811. Um, we have folks who contact me all the time who, um, you know, are looking for an early vital record and or a church record or um, something from those first couple decades of our existence. And unfortunately, there's just very, very little that exists because um, we were a frontier. We had itinerant preachers that came through initially to stop in each of the little communities to offer a service. Um, there, there just isn't, there wasn't enough real um, human occupation to warrant having um, a lot of record keeping. And, um, and just kind of to illustrate that, this is the vault that was built in 1810 by the Holland Land Company. They were required to build a stone vault in each county to um, safeguard the records. So this is, you know, their uh, version of a fireproof vault. Um, and the Holland Land agent's house was adjacent to this. The building in the background is the courthouse that stood here on this site previous to this one that doesn't stand any longer. And um, so the postcard is wrong. It wasn't built in 1802. It was built in 1810. And all of the records were kept in there. 
Um, if any of you ever have an opportunity to do research in New York State, even though all the counties here do things a little differently, um, there are similarities. And most of the counties in Western New York use um, this table, and you've probably, you may have seen it in other places as well. There's a couple different tables. This is a Graves indexing table. There's a Lusk indexing table. And this is how all of our land records and our court records were indexed forever. So um, if you see it in other places, the way that these tables work is that you start with the um, first letter of the last name, which would be the large letter in bold in the upper left corner. You move down that column to the second letter of the last name, and then across to the third letter of the last name. And so if the name was ALP, for example, then um, any name that started with ALP would be on page 22. So you don't really need to know the rest of the last name. Um, and sometimes that's helpful, especially if it's a name where there's a lot of different spelling variations um, after the first three letters. Um, these tables can be helpful because every name that starts with us, the first same three letters are going to be on the same page and then they're just listed um, chronologically. So all of our deeds um, are indexed by the buyer and seller. So there are grantor and grantee indexes that you can search based on this key table. Um, so these are very common in a lot of the courthouses in New York State, and they actually really function very well. Um, for most of our last names, this setup was perfectly adequate to make sure everything was findable. Uh, we only run into quite um, issues here with some Swedish names, really, because we have a very big Swedish population in the southern part of the county, and so the pages for Anderson and Carlson and Johnson basically just keep continuing um, ad nauseum at the back of the book because we, we, we never have enough room for those common Swedish surnames. So um, another thing about the land records that can be helpful, there was nothing in New York State that said that you were required to file a deed when you purchased or sold land. And that can be problematical because that means there's often gaps in the uh, chain of ownership. But what is helpful, because especially because early on, there aren't a lot of um, vital records. But when a, when a man purchased property, he could purchase it without his wife's name being on the deed. But he could not sell it unless his wife also is named on the deed and signs the deed. So any sale of property in New York State from 1811 on had to include the name of a spouse. So that can be really helpful if you are, you know, searching for an ancestor and you haven't found his wife's name, or if it's a common name like Anderson and you don't know where they lived, but you know the wife's name, then you can narrow down your search by, um, by checking the sale of property and you'll see the wife's name. And what they actually did back historically is they would take the woman into another room and ask her without her husband present if she was truly agreeable to selling the property and um, that she wasn't being coerced or doing it under duress. And, and that was to protect her interests financially. Um, you certainly wouldn't want a husband to decide to take off and sell the family farm and leave his wife and children. Um, without a place to live. So, so that can be helpful if you're, you know, searching for an early family here. Uh, this was the first county clerk's office. It still stands. It's right across the street from our um, current courthouse. And I, I think it's kind of funny because it, it's so tiny. And, you know, the clerks in New York State are the holders of so many records. Um, the county clerk is the um, obviously the holder of all the land records, so mortgages, deeds. And then also the county clerk is the chief clerk for the Supreme County Courts in New York State. 
So all of the court records from Supreme County Court, and I'll talk more about them in a minute, in a bit, um, are held by the county clerk. And this was the first clerk's office. Um, and it's it's just cute and charming, and it has a little tiny safe in the middle in the middle wall, which um, would never hold enough you know records to accommodate the office for very long. Um, this is the second county clerk's office. This was built in 1859, so you can see by 1859 there was a need for more space. Uh, this building was added on to again, and it wasn't until our current courthouse was built in 1908 when they until they actually included office space in the courthouse for the county clerk. So up until 1908, the clerk's office was separate, which really surprises me considering that they hold so many vital records um, that people are still using today. We have never had a disastrous loss of records in this county. You know, other places in New York State have had um, several floods down along the southern tier of the state. They have, they're, they're susceptible to flooding. Some places have had fires. We're very fortunate. Uh, we have the very first deed ever recorded here in 1811. We have court records, um, minute books going back to 1811. The only time we've really ever experienced significant loss was really by um, neglect. Unfortunately, we found out in the 1850s that the custodian in the clerk's building, so uh, this building that you're looking at, was using the early minute books to uh, light the fire in the wood stove. So, um, so that was unfortunate. Um, and when they found out what he was doing, they put a stop to it. But so we do have a little gap in some of our Board of Supervisors minutes um, because of um, the custodian from the 1850s. So even though we've never had a disastrous loss, um, we also never really had a great place to keep all of our ar archival records. And um, you can imagine, you know, having all of the records that were created since 1811, um, space was always an issue. And when I was hired here, um, there were records in uh, the judge's bathroom and there were records in the attic of the courthouse and in abandoned stairwells. Um, they basically were always just looking for places to shove records that they felt they didn't need any longer or that they didn't access any longer, but they still needed to keep. So fortunately an inventory was done in the 1990s and they kind of determined um, how much space they thought they would need. I was hired as a consultant in 1996 and we started writing grants immediately to um, just purge records that could be purged, store records better that needed to be stored. We started microfilming. Um, and in 2006, we opened a central repository. So we actually have one facility now for all of our department's records. And it's the only place in our complex where we have fire suppression. So we have a sprinkler system, we have water detectors, smoke detectors, and it's secure. It's got its own HVAC system so we can control the temperature and humidity. So I feel like we've accomplished a lot um, in the last 20 years or so. And it was primarily because um, there were grant records available to us that unfortunately mostly have dried up, but we did a lot. We now do a lot of scanning. Um, so we're trying to, you know, I, I, I feel as a historian and as the archivist here that, you know, we're told we have to keep these records permanently. I want to make them available. I, you know, the whole reason for keeping them in my mind is so that people can have access to them. So we try really hard to help folks when they come here looking for information. Um, I don't know if you're aware that New York State did a census on its own that was uh, separate from the federal censuses. I know some other states did as well, but so there's a New York state census in um, 1825, 35 and 45, and those are not enumerated um, for every household member. They were just the head of household. And then there were uh, statistics for the number of males and females. A um, lot of information about agriculture. So you can find out a lot about um, what was being produced on anybody's farm and the number of livestock, the number of sheep. Um, 
not so much about family members, unfortunately, but I know in 1845, they did ask the question if anybody in the household, male or female, had died within the last year. And, you know, for what it's worth, sometimes that can be the little bit of a clue that you need when you can't find that person in the 1850 federal census. Um, so, and then of course, starting in 50, they started enumerating everybody and the New York state census for 1855 has everybody listed with their age. And it can be very helpful if your family moved across New York state. Um, they asked if you were born in New York state, which county you were born in. So that is very helpful. Um, and obviously they asked, you know, if it wasn't New York state, then they would say which country you were from or which other state. So if your family was moving across New York state and you weren't sure exactly where they were at any given time, that 1855 census can help track them, track their journey across. And the 1865 census included um, information about anyone's military service in the Civil War. So even if a man wasn't in the household, he's listed as being in the service and it includes um, often, not all the time, but quite often, it includes um, the regiment that they're in. So, and then there's a um, table at the back of that, uh, for each town, there's a table for any soldiers who um, were killed or died during their time in the service. So that can be a valuable um, resource too, if you may have had an ancestor who served in the Civil War. We had a lot of regiments that were recruited here in Chautauqua County, and they're documented quite well. We have a full set of rosters for the county um, that we digitized, so that's available on my website, which I'll also show you a little bit later, uh, a link to it. So, um, so there is quite a bit of information that's available regarding military service. Uh, we did have some men that fought in the War of 1812, right? You know, we are on the Great Lakes and um, there were some regiments that were sent to Buffalo to fight. Um, and some of our men were killed. Um, it, it's, it's probably not as well documented as later wars, but we do have some really great references locally. So if anybody thinks they may have had an ancestor in the War of 1812, um, we do have some things that were compiled from local records that we can try to help you with. Um, and then the last state census is 18, well, the last of the 19th century is 1875. They didn't do one in 1885 or 95, um, but then they pick up again and they have them in 1905, 1915, 1925. Um, so those can be very helpful. They're, they're, they contain a lot of information. All of the censuses from the 19th century were indexed and extracted by our genealogical society, which is an amazing group. They have done so much awesome work with some of the records um, that genealogists use all the time. They've done um, our local newspapers extracting marriage information and deaths and also just other things that are of interest and um, curiosity. And they, they've done these censuses. Um, and what's nice about that is, and I use Ancestry too, but you know, sometimes the indexing that was done on Ancestry is um, close, but no cigar. <laughs> and um, the folks, and maybe it's because they're here and they recognize a lot of the names, or maybe it's just because they were working from the actual books but I think their indexing is more accurate than um, some of the ones that were done um, by Ancestry. And so we use our local books quite heavily. Um, and sometimes it's just nice to compare, you know, you can look and see what was indexed um, at the state or national level and compare it to what our local folks came up with. And sometimes it's even just verifying a birthplace or an age or a relationship to the head of household. And I think sometimes it was hard to read on the copy that was um, indexed elsewhere um, if they were indexing from microfilm, but often you can read it quite well in the books that we have. So um, those are a great, those are a great asset. <clears throat> so we also have um, naturalization records starting in about 1814 and then 
they run here locally through 1972. And we had, um, we had kind of a unique situation that I, I don't know that happened anywhere else in New York State. Um, but just generally speaking, the naturalization records um, can be useful, they, but they don't contain as much information as you might hope or expect. And if any of you haven't had an opportunity to look at any naturalization records anywhere else, um, what happened is a person had to appear in court and file a declaration of intention, which you know, is exactly what it sounds like. What the document says, it's that it's my intention to become a citizen of the United States and to give up my allegiance to my country of origin. And so folks had to file a declaration of intention first, and then they had to wait three to five years, depending on the time period. Um, and there were other conditions. You couldn't leave the country. You, you couldn't get arrested. Um, and you had to have two people come back to court with you as character witnesses. And you could file your final petition, which was the document that actually granted you citizenship. The oath of allegiance is on that final petition. And, um, and at that point, you were a citizen. So those are filed here in our Supreme Court. Um, and a copy was sent to the federal government. Um, the record, the, the information they requested early on was basically nothing. The, the person who appeared in court had to give their name, the country they were giving up allegiance to, and then the date they appeared in court. And that's all the information that was collected. So they really weren't that concerned about who was asking to become a citizen. Um, occasionally somebody's petition was denied if um, they couldn't prove they had basic understanding of the English language. Um, they couldn't you know, read or write English. Um, sometimes it was denied if they knew that the person had left the country um, or gotten into trouble. Um, the other document I mentioned here on this uh, screen is the certificate of arrival, which they don't have those initially. When war broke out in Europe um, around 1916, folks here started to get very concerned about who was coming into the country. Um, and so suddenly there was just this, you know, explosion of information that was required when you filed both your declaration of, of intention and your petition. And so um, we went from basically having a third of a page worth of information for each person to having, you know, a full sheet for the declaration of intention. And you had to indicate your full name, the, um, the town or village where you were born, the date of your birth, um, the date you left, what port you left from, which port you arrived to, um, the name of your spouse, the date you were married, that person's place of birth, the names and dates of your children, dates of your children's birth, where they were born. And, um, and so, and then that often accompanied a certificate of arrival, which is um, a little document that gave the port and the name of the ship and the captain and the date for your arrival. So, and the petition repeated all that information. And since the petition was filed three to five years after the declaration, um, you know, if somebody was single when they filed their declaration, but then were married by the time their petition was filed, then that information is updated. So then it will name their spouse when and where they were married. If any more children have been born, it will give their places of birth and dates of birth. So <clears throat> they're incredibly informative and a, just a huge you know, wealth of information. Um, a couple things to mention though, is that it's very rare. We, we do have some, but most women did not get their own citizenship because before they had the right to vote, there really wasn't any need to, and their citizenship was based on their husbands. So a woman, if she came to this country and she was single, often a woman would just wait until she was married and then her citizenship was granted to her based on her husband's. Now that didn't always work out well. And we have a very small book 
of um, repatriations. And so what would happen if a woman married a man whose citizenship had not yet been finalized, if he died before he got his final papers, she was stripped of her citizenship. So even if your ancestors came on the Mayflower, you may have never stepped foot off of American soil. Um, if you married a man who had not yet been naturalized, your citizenship was taken away from you. Seems hard to believe. Um, so what those women had to do is they had to ask to be readmitted to the country, to the country. They weren't, they didn't get their husband's citizenship either. Like if you married a guy from Germany and he died, you weren't suddenly a citizen of Germany. You were just basically a displaced person. You had no citizenship whatsoever. Um, that didn't work in reverse. That wasn't the case for men. If they, if a man married a woman from another country, it was strictly for women. And so we do have a small book of situations where, you know, a woman was married to a guy and he was killed in a logging accident before he got his final papers. So she had to uh, fill out paperwork, explain the situation and ask to be readmitted. Um, so uh, students awfully get quite upset when they hear about that. They just can't believe that that's the way <laughs> women were treated. So um, it's a good educate. It's a good uh, learning opportunity for for students. Um, children, if you were under sixteen when your father got his final papers, you generally were granted citizenship. The um, situation changed periodically over time as the naturalization laws changed. But generally speaking, um, that was the situation for children, which uh, later on, if you were an adult and you needed to prove you were a citizen and you didn't have your own papers, you would have to come back to court and you would have to prove your age and prove that your father's citizenship was granted when you were still under 16. And then you would get a, a separate sort of a certificate that just said that you were a child um, who, who had been um, granted their citizenship under their fathers. And so for some folks, it didn't happen very often, surprisingly, but for some folks, they had to come back to court here and, and request that documentation um, because something they were doing required them to show that they were naturalized. The situation that was occurring in Chautauqua County um, that was kind of unique is that in 1851, a train line opened from New York City, basically New York Harbor, all the way across New York State to Chautauqua County. So the terminus of that train line was in Dunkirk, which is right on Lake Erie. It had been talked about for decades because everybody here felt neglected because the Erie Canal didn't come to us. And so people in the Southern part of New York State had complained that the Erie Canal bypassed them. And so there had been talk of building a train line. And you can imagine what sort of an undertaking that was to build a train line across this rather mountainous, at least hilly, uh, we are in the foothills of the Appalachians, um, to get a train line across New York State. The train line opened in 1851. And um, everybody here was hugely excited about it. We thought it was going to be this huge economic boon. And people were snatching up parcels of land in Dunkirk. But actually what happened at the same time is New York City was being overwhelmed with newly arriving immigrants um, from Ireland, Germany. Um, and the city was having a really hard time assisting them. And so Starting in the fall of 1851, there was a daily immigrant train from New York Harbor all the way across New York State to Chautauqua County. And so um, we started having immigrants arriving every day from the train. And generally speaking, when they arrived here, they didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have um, anywhere to go. And the New York state law required the county to transport people needing aid to our poor farm, which I'll talk about later, and, um, and support them there until they were, until they had the means to move on to wherever it, is, it was their original, you know, destination was. And so 
um, what we found out. So our board of supervisors was struggling to find out why, um, you know, we suddenly had a poor farm bursting at the seams with, with immigrants. And they went to New York City and these immigrants were, you know, telling them that when they got off the boat at New York Harbor, they were told, you know, here's a train ticket. And when you get to the, um, get to your destination, you're going to find a job, you're going to find a place to live, you know, everything will be wonderful for you. So somebody in New York City was trying to alleviate the burden of all the immigrants there by giving them a free train ticket all the way across New York State to Chautauqua County. And um, we were, the county was like, afraid they were going to go bankrupt because of the additional support that was being required for these folks. So what we did was we started keeping very detailed information about every immigrant who came to Chautauqua County and requested aid from us. So those were the people that we had to take to the poor farm. We actually hired extra poor masters to work at Dunkirk Harbor and to work at the poor farm. And we started documenting, you know, the, these individuals' names, their ages, um, where they came from, when they arrived in New York Harbor, um, their kind of their social situation, if they if they had the means to perhaps move on or if their intention was to stay here and try to establish themselves as farmers. Um, and then we were submitting those reports to the state commissioners of immigration in the hopes of getting reimbursed, which didn't go well. The commissioners of immigration were struggling just to take care of the immigrants in New York City. So we rarely got reimbursed like we thought we would, but from about 1853 until 1867, we kept these very detailed logs of who we were helping because we hoped we were going to get reimbursed. And so our genealogical society has indexed all of those records. And there are over 60,000 immigrants who were given aid here in Chautauqua County. And some of them did go on, you know, some of them went farther west, some of them um, intended to go to you know, Wisconsin, Minneapolis. We had a lot of folks who, you know, had plans to get on the Great Lakes and take, um, take a ship farther west. And so sometimes they only needed to stay at the poor farm long enough to wait for the next ship to, to come or to wait for the weather to break. <coughs> So anyway, that's a, a great resource. I just think it's so um, wonderful that those records have been indexed so that people, you know, if you're living west of us and you believe your family may have migrated through this area, it might help you determine who was here, <clears throat> um, what ship they arrived on and when. Um, you know, unfortunately, people didn't always um, farewell on that journey across the ocean. And so by the time they got here, they were sickly. Um, you know, some people, by the time they got off the train, they were too sick to walk. Um, sometimes they died, you know, at the poor farm. And so we have those records and, and I just think they're a great resource. So, um, I've talked to some other historians across New York, New York state, and nobody has, um, Nobody seems to have experienced that as much as us. Um, and I think it is because the terminus of that train line came all the way to Chautauqua County. So I haven't talked about vital records. And, and that's because New York State was really late to start requiring anyone to collect births, deaths, or marriages. So the law didn't pass until 1880 and it went into effect for 1881. And the other problem that I, I, what I perceive as a problem is that in New York State, vital records are kept at the town level. So oftentimes people will contact me and they'll say, well, I know my ancestors were married in Chautauqua County. And I'll say, well, what town? And they don't know. And that's a problem because we have 27 towns, 11 villages and two cities. And so by having the marriage and birth and death records be uh, held at the town level, if you don't know which town, you have a really hard time 
uh, finding them. You don't want to start sending letters and research fees to 27 different towns. Um, the other issue with that is that um, we're a very rural county and many of our town clerks are part-time employees. Uh, some of them actually still work from home. It's not like working from home now. It means that they, you know, just have a little desk in their in their house and that's where they do their job. And the vital record books might be at the town highway department or in the basement, basement of one of the town buildings. Um, the town clerks are elected every four years and they don't always um, get any sort of orientation or education about the vital records other than the ones that they're filing um, currently, which are all electronic. So they have very little opportunity uh, to understand the old books. And so um, it's frustrating, you can probably tell, it's a little frustrating sometimes <laughs> for us to get these phone calls and people will say, well, you know, I called the town and they, they don't think they have the record, so they said you must. And, you know, I was like, well, they don't have the record because New York State didn't require it until 1881. So it's not that we have it, it just doesn't exist. Um, it can be a problem for so many folks who are trying to get in the DAR, trying to get in the Mayflower Society, and they're looking for a certified record or something that's official, <clears throat> and they just don't exist. Um, so Anyway, that's in New York State, the vital records are late um, to be uh, created and they're held at the town level and some towns are less capable or willing to understand <clears throat> the value that these hold for researchers and they're not always very receptive to getting these phone calls. The thing that kind of <clears throat> adds to that is because if you remember on that map I showed you before, New York State, our county is bordered on two sides by PA and Ohio is just a quick little jump across that little chimney of Pennsylvania. So in New York State, it was really easy to get married. There was no waiting period. Um, all you had to do is jump on the train, come across the state line, find the first JP you could find, pay the fee, or go to the town clerk, get the application, go to a JP, get hitched. You were in and out in a couple, <clears throat> a couple hours, go on your merry way and you're married. So we started having this influx of people coming from Pennsylvania and Ohio and just coming to the first town uh, across the line and getting hitched. And um, so here, you know, we have towns that were, are still incredibly small, very rural, not a big population, and yet they have hundreds and thousands of marriage records. Um, the term that was used for that is Gretna Green, which refers to a town in Scotland that was close to the border with England. And apparently that was the case there that people from England would go across the state line to this town in Scotland called Gretna Green, and they could get married there without a waiting period. So, um, so that's what they—that's how they refer to these towns. And the town of Ripley, which is um, right on Lake Erie, right on the Pennsylvania border, um, was really the hub of all of that. And so, in the 1930s, 1920s, and 30s, they had two full-time justices of the peace who worked, worked around the clock and uh, the historian who's now deceased, the historian for Ripley told me that um, the JP in town was the only person that could afford to buy a vehicle during the depression because he was making two dollars for every marriage he performed and he was basically busy all the time. So he was just, you know, raking in money. Um, by the end of the, the 1930s, that situation had changed. New York State started to require a waiting period. And so that little um, boom for some of our towns died off. But during that time period, there were just so many marriages. And for some reason, um, the state required the county to get copies of those marriage records from 1908 to April of 1935. So 
even though we're not the official holder of marriage records, we have um, a complete comprehensive index for marriage records from that time period. Um, so, you know, I always feel like if somebody will call me and they'll say they're looking for a marriage record, I'm like, oh, I hope it's in this time period because it's so easy for us to find. Um, we don't have to refer them to a town. Uh, we make a copy for $10. And I think the towns now, according to New York state law, can charge up to $2,750 for a request for a vital record. So um, I just don't, I don't see the point. I mean, we have the records easy enough to make a copy. Um, so those records are here, they're available. Um, anybody can come in and actually just use the indexes. And I know in the towns, New York State's really strict about letting people have access to vital records. And I don't know if it's a good thing or not, but other, I know in Pennsylvania on uh, Ancestry, the death records are pretty much out there, you know, um, for anybody to use. And in New York State, that is not the case. Uh, the town clerks really guard those closely and nobody can just sit down and look at their registers. You have to file a request and the clerk will look for what you're asking and provide you with a copy for a fee. So uh, much stricter here than other places. So even though New York made it really, really hard to, or they, yeah, they made it really easy to get married. They made it really hard to get a divorce. So um, a lot of people from New York state left and went elsewhere to get a divorce. Um, in New York State, you had to have um, proven grounds. And so we call it the three A's. You had to have a proof of adultery, abandonment, or abuse. And those were pretty much the only reason, ways that you could get a divorce. And by proof, you actually had to have people who would be willing to testify that they had witnessed this. And uh, I can imagine how difficult that would be for a person um, to, come and, to come and testify that they had seen their neighbor doing something, you know, untoward. Um, so a lot of people didn't get divorced here. They would go elsewhere. In New York State, if you could prove the grounds, then what they would do is they would, in, they would um, issue an interlocutory uh, judgment which basically was an interim judgment because the ultimate goal of the courts was to have you resolve your dis differences and get back together. So in a divorce action, the first judgment was always interlocutory and it gave you a three month waiting period to whatever, cool off, resolve your differences, and then if you didn't and you still wanted to be divorced, then they would issue a final judgment. Um, it's very typical in these old divorce records to see where uh, the guilty party in the divorce judgment, it will say that, you know, the party, whoever was found guilty of whatever caused the divorce would be, it would not be allowed for them to remarry until their former spouse was dead but the former spouse could remarry. So um, people see that and they're surprised because you know, they know for a fact that their ancestor uh, went across the state line and got married three months later, but they weren't really legally allowed to get remarried if their final judgment of divorce indicated that. So um, it was a lot easier to you know, go to a different county or go across the state line and kind of reinvent yourself. Um, even some of the people who came here to get married in, in the town of Ripley, there are letters in with the marriage records where a very irate parent or um, a spouse will say, you know, my child or my spouse came to your town and got married and, you know, they're already married or they're only 15 and, you know, how could you have done this? And, you know, so, Anyway, it was easy back then. You didn't have a lot of proof to show to be able to do some of the things that people were doing. Um, so the divorce records are filed in our civil and criminal uh, court indexes, which I'll talk about, but they are uh, sealed for 100 years. So nobody can see a divorce 
um, until 100 years have passed from the final judgment. And that's another thing where people will call and they'll say, you know, my grandparents were divorced in the 1920s and I just want to know, you know, we think there might have been a child born that we're not aware of um, and we can't let them see it. And even though, you know, it's it's reasonable that both parties are deceased um, it, and it, that doesn't matter. We can't allow them to open those records for 100 years. So that is the, the standard in New York State. We have them, we can let them know the judgment date and the names of both parties, but that's all we can tell them. So also in New York State, and this is probably true in all the counties, um, early on, in order to file deeds and mortgages and judgments, the counties had to purchase ledger books. And I think because they were always, you know, very, um, budget sensitive, and they didn't want to spend a ton of money on a bunch of different ledger books. Um, they have a record series called miscellaneous and miscellaneous records started 1811 and it was basically where they filed anything that wasn't a deed or a mortgage or a, a money judgment. So there are just a ton of different records embedded in miscellaneous records. And they're indexed by the name of the, you know, the, the, the main, name of the main party. So it might be a political appointment or an oath of office or an indebted prisoner um, filing a debt resolution so they can get out of jail. Um, there are early adoptions in there. Um, military discharges, like I said, I can see on the screen here, change of names. There's just all sorts of different things. Um, there's also a church incorporations and uh, some business incorporations, plank roads, because uh, there was a time period when um, there was a lot of money and energy invested in plank roads to try to improve transportation. And so um, these plank roads were incorporated and most of them failed after a few years, but they actually were just, you know, laying planks. I mean, they probably exist out there as well um, to, to try to improve transportation um, when, the, when the weather um, made it difficult because of mud or snow to get around. So we still have miscellaneous records. Um, the adoptions that are filed there are not sealed. So until through 1943, we can search the miscellaneous records for adoptions. And if, if your ancestor's record is in there, we are not restricted at all in um, our ability to provide you with access. So they're indexed by the child's biological name, birth name, and then also by the names of their adoptive parents. So it's, 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 it's informative. I mean, it's a great place to look. Um, starting in 1943 and then the state required us to seal them. And so they went from having no restriction on them to being completely sealed. And so we can't under any circumstances open an adoption record after 1943 um, without a court order. And so there has been a little more activity. Um, and actually there is a new law in New York state that an adoptive child can request information, um, but they don't send those to us. Those go to the New York State Department of State. So we really don't have much to do with that new law. I know it's out there and I know that adoptive, adopted children have the ability to get some more information, but they don't do it through us. So we can't open those without a court order. Um, sometimes there is a medical reason why somebody wants to have an, an adoption opened and they can get a court order to do that, but they're not going to get anything out of that file except whatever medical information um, the courts feel they can see without revealing any information um, about their birth family. So uh, miscellaneous, miscellaneous is a wealth of information and you just never know what you're going to find there. Um, so I mentioned our court records. County clerk is the keeper of civil and criminal court records. 
In New York State, there's also surrogate court, and that is where um, probate records are held. So wills, um, guardianships, anything pertaining to an estate settlement. I didn't really go into them, um, but they're here. They're indexed. They're open to the public. So, um, you know, if, if your ancestor died here and there's a will, um, it's relatively easy to find it. You can write to surrogate court. I'm not sure if they take email requests. Um, they're in this building and I run up there periodically anyway. So if somebody has, has a request or a question, I'm more than happy to, um, you know, take a look in their indexes for you to see if there is anything there. And then if there is, and you want to contact them for copies, you know, I can help you with the, um, the, the contact information for them. So, um, th that can be helpful as to, um, but in the county clerk's office, which is really where my department, um, exists, um, we deal with the civil and criminal court records. And from 1811 until 1997, which is when we went to our first computer system, they were only ever indexed by the name of the defendant, which is very problematical um, because, you know, if your ancestor or your party of interest was the plaintiff in an action, we just don't have any way to find it. And that's, that's just the way it is. Um, land records are indexed by both parties, the buyer and the seller. Mortgages are indexed that way, but the court records are not. They can be very informative um, and they're generally open to the public. There, there are very few types of civil or criminal court records that are not open. Um, so I always encourage people if you're here and you're doing genealogy, um, just go ahead and look in the, the indexes to those records because you just never know what you might find. You know, sometimes there's some sort of a family squabble or there's something, you know, we found some very um, interesting things in there um, that can help people with their family history. So, um, so those are here and they're, they're open. Um, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a huge um, body of records and a lot of them have been digitized uh, for the recent records. Most of the archival ones are not, so it does involve us having to pull the paper, but we're happy to do that. Um, the indexes are online. So the county clerk's office has a subscription-based um, online system, and I think it's called um, Search IQS, IQS, searchiqs.com. And they're a vendor that has... Um, that works for a lot of county clerks in New York State. And you can just look through their list of counties and click on Chautauqua County. And then I think it's um, $15 for 30 minutes of unlimited access. So for $15, you can search the clerk's um, court records, uh, current ones, the indexes to land and court going back to 1811. They're there on that um, um, interface online. And then if you find something, you can contact us and we'll, we'll make a copy for you. But it's, it's not a free service because um, the system is expensive to maintain. <clears throat> I did mention our poor farm. I'll mention it again just because it is a, a very important part of the county's function. Um, in New York State, before there were poor farms, each town had a, an appointed poor master. And so the poor master's job was to determine who truly in any given town was indigent or who could not support themselves. So um, if somebody was either begging on the street or if somebody felt that a family wasn't able to feed their children or um, you know, if, if a farmer was injured in a, in a farm accident or a hunting accident and he couldn't support his family, the poor master would <clears throat> try to find any possible source of support that he could find. So he would, you know, find out if he belonged to a church or some other sort of um, organization that might 
give you temporary help. Um, they would ask about your family members to see if you had any family members who were financially able to, able to help you. And if they couldn't find anyone, then you would be declared truly indigent. And what each town did is they would actually hold a public auction once a year, um, or perhaps even more frequently if a, if a family was in need. Um, and they, they would auction off the indigent person or family to the lowest bidder. So somebody might bid $30 to provide an indigent person with food, clothing, and shelter for a year. And the low bidder would be awarded that indigent. And so they were, you know, they would take them home with them and then they were obligated to provide them with food, clothing, and shelter. But, you know, there wasn't a lot of monitoring of those situations going on. So each town had to keep track of who had bid on which indigent for how much. And often there were reports, not just here, but across New York State, of those people being treated really poorly. I, you know, you can imagine the situation some people would find themselves in where they weren't being adequately clothed or fed, um, where they, maybe they were just put right to, to work and uh, forced, you know, there were stories of people being forced to live in the barn. Um, it was a nightmare to kind of keep track of all these different accounts of who had bid how much. Nobody was checking up on the poor. There were stories of people being abused. Um, so the state was trying to come up with a solution that would standardize care for the poor. And their idea was for counties to establish poor farms where the indigents from the entire county would be sent and put to work and um, they would be given housing there and food. And so the, the state law went into effect in 1830 and, and the county was large enough at that point where we were required to build a poor farm. And we spent um, a couple years finding the right property, purchasing the property and then building um, a structure there. So the first building they built was a two-story wooden structure that was meant to house 200, uh, 100 uh, poor people. And the way that the county funded it was by charging back each town for the number of people that they sent there. And in most cases, the people who were there um, were there for temporary assistance. So um, if your situation warranted you needing help, you would go there. And then when your situation changed, you could leave. So um, and it was a working farm. So once you got there, you were given um, a, a place to stay and you were expected to work in whatever capacity you could. So people worked on the farm, they worked in the kitchen, um, they made blankets, they wove rugs, they made clothing. Um, this, the facility that's in this picture was built in 1869. So it was a little bit after the farm was started. But when this building was built, it was considered to be the most beautiful building in the county. And I think that's just kind of a testament to, um, you know, the fact that they're, they really were concerned about these folks' well-being. And the farm was a very well-run farm. Um, it provided the food for the jail. So it saved county taxpayers money by um, making the bread and um, meat and growing the produce for the jail. Um, people who were found panhandling in any town might be sent here. So they, they referred to the folks there as inmates and you could be sentenced there for 30 or 60 or 90 days if you were found to be um, panhandling or um, trying to um, work as a prostitute in a town. Um, and sometimes, and it wasn't really a prison. I mean, there were no gates or um, cells. And so people would abscond. And we have the superintendent's reports and um, daily journals from the poor farm from the time it was opened in 1832. And so it's a wonderful resource. Once again, our County Genealogical Society's members have indexed those books. And um, I just can't say enough about the wonderful work that they've done. Those, those folks just 
have made so much information available for people and they've published them in books and they've been sold all over the country. And um, recently they gave me permission to put them on my website. So the books that they published have been scanned by us here and they're on my website. So it's a wonderful resource. It includes all of those immigrants that came here and got help, but also just includes all of the county residents who went there and it was, you know, like I said, it was generally for people in a transitory situation. And, um, and then of course they had, you know, this was really the only welfare program that existed. And so people who couldn't take care of themselves, sometimes it was a mental illness. Um, and so they did have a hospital that they built there, um, you know, and throughout its history, it was called an asylum. It's called a lunatic asylum, but there was a separate facility for the mentally ill. Um, they did the best they could, but of course, you know, by today's standards, I think we, you know, we would probably judge them harshly, but at the time they were doing what they could with the bottom line always being to try to make um, decisions that were the most um beneficial to county taxpayers. So not always willing to spend a lot of money. Um, as our understanding of special needs changed and other facilities were built, there was a school for the blind, there was a, a, a institution for epileptics um, in the state. And so the state started requiring us to send people there rather than keeping them at a poor farm. And the county fought that every single time because they said we can keep them here, they're closer to their families, and it's, and it's more cost effective for taxpayers. But we always lost those fights. And so as other institutions were developed across New York State, um, those folks were sent to those institutions. And our Board of Supervisors reports every year lists all the different institutions where county residents were sent, and if they were a county charge, how much it was costing the county to board them there. So um, the Board of Supervisors reports can be very informative um, when those other institutions started drawing people away from the poor farm. So the poor farm had its own cemetery. Um, the cemetery at the poor farm was also used for inmates who died at the jail if there was no family to take them away. So um, this institution was uh, outside of our county seat and it was there until 1959 when the county built a new what they call it by that point it was called a nursing home and they built that um, to be closer to a certified hospital and this facility was closed. And now none of those buildings are there. They were all eventually um, demolished because they were not being maintained. <clears throat> the person who bought the property couldn't maintain them, changed hands and just went downhill from there. So, um, but the records exist and they're wonderful and we're so happy that we have this information. Um, some people are embarrassed when I, when somebody's here doing research and we can't find anything about their ancestor and I suggest maybe we should look in the poor farm. Some people think, you know, oh, I don't wanna know that my ancestor was in a poor farm. And I tell them, you know, you might not be here today if your ancestor hadn't gotten the care that they needed at that time from the poor farm. So you might think that, you know, maybe you should be thankful for the fact that the poor farm existed and they may have um, gotten, you know, medical or financial support there for a period of time. So don't judge. <laughs> and this is the backside. You can see what a huge complex it was. I mean, it was just an amazing undertaking. They had their own schoolhouse. Not that they could always, they, they used the inmates themselves to teach the children who were there. And so if they didn't have anybody who was capable of teaching, they just simply didn't do it. So some kids who were there um, didn't have any schooling, but like I said, most people weren't there all that long. Um, they had, you know, their own boiler, their own reservoir for water, um, a, you know, a huge kitchen. They had far, uh, barns for all the different uh, products and livestock. So it, it was a big undertaking. Uh, we also had a, a tuberculosis hospital, like so many other counties did, um, before they, you know, fully understood TB and didn't have um, treatment for it. Um, they did try to treat people at these hospitals. We do have some very large, uh, no, not mountains, but big hills in Chautauqua County. And at the time, they believed that TB patients um, did better in 
cold air in high elevations. And that's why like one of the first TB hospitals in the country was up in the Adirondack Mountains in New York State. So um, they built a hospital on top of a very high hill in Chautauqua County. And um, it gets very cold here in the winter. We get a lot of snow. And the, build, the hospital was built with these huge windows that opened up onto porches where entire hospital beds could be wheeled out onto the porch. And those folks actually slept outside year round. Um, they bundled them up really well, but it's, it's amazing to see some of the photographs of people who were sent to the TB hospital for treatment. Um, so we, do, we don't have a lot of the records. They were sent, um, a lot of them were sent to the state health department and have been destroyed since the hospital was closed. But we did find some admission records on microfilm that we didn't know we had. And so we only found those in the last couple of years and we're in the process of we're not getting any information out of them that's sensitive or medical, but um, each person when they were admitted gave a little bit of a biographical um, history of themselves and their families, talking about where they were born, where they worked, um, if their siblings are alive and well and their parents. So from a genealogical, genealogical perspective, um, I think these could be helpful someday. And so we're, we're extracting out information from the microfilm that we think will help genealogists. And when we're done, we'll be able to put that on the website and it'll just be another possible place where somebody might find information about someone who was here. Not everybody who was at our TB hospital was from Chautauqua County. Um, not really exactly sure how that worked out, but um, there are people who were admitted there who were from really all over the place. There's a woman from Florida, one from California. Um, and I don't know if they were just maybe traveling here or they had a reason to be here and they were tested and tested positive and so they were sent there. Um, but uh, we were the first place to do um, in school x rays. So we had a mobile unit that went out to county all the schools in the county and took x rays of every single child's chest because they found out that the x rays would show tuberculosis present in the lungs before any physical symptoms were present. And that allowed them to start treating the lungs earlier. So we were really groundbreaking um, at the time to do that. And then the other thing they did is establish a summer camp for children where they could come and spend the whole summer and they got three healthy meals a day um, because they really felt that good nutrition and um, getting out of cramped quarters was, was healthy for the students. So, so those, that's, a, that's a group of records that's being worked on. Um, and it, hopefully before I retire, we'll have um, another resource for genealogists. <clears throat> so we put as much stuff on my website as we can. A lot of it is uh, attributed to volunteers who are out there doing all kinds of amazing research and compiling information. There's a group that has focused on anti-slavery activities in the county and they have uh, secured copies of anti-slavery petitions that were sent to the House of Representatives um, by different abolitionist groups in our county. A lot of churches signed those petitions. Um, and so they've built this amazing interactive map that's just so cool. You can see across the county how many different people um, are linked to an anti-slavery event and um, there was actually a slave capture in Chautauqua County. Um, an escaped slave was living here and working on a farm and his uh, a slave catcher came up. It was after the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. And so it really tied our hands and made it impossible for us to, um, to fight the slave catcher. He had the sheriff of the county with him because the Fugitive Slave Act required our law enforcement to help slave catchers. And so, um, so they came up, snatched this poor young man and took him back to Virginia. So um, that story is documented there. Um, we also have a historic structure database where they're going through each of our towns and taking photographs of 19th century houses and then um, trying to locate them on our early 
county maps and atlases. And they're also using the 1855 census because that census indicates whether your house is log or frame or brick. And so um, it's just an amazing database to help people document the history of their properties. So that's that's awesome. And then the Genealog Genealogical Society I mentioned, it was primarily done by a woman and her husband, Lois and Norwood Barris. And so they have um, extracted information from our early county newspapers, which started in 1819 and 1824. And so often that's the only place we find any mention you know, of a death or a marriage um, because we don't have vital records. So the, the newspapers um, being extracted has been a huge benefit. Uh, the poor farm ledgers, um, anything they found that was from a miscellaneous source and there really wasn't enough information from that source to just publish it independently. They put in these three, it's a three volume set called gleanings and it's just stuff from all over the place that would help a genealogist. So that's on my website. Any of the cemeteries that they've read stones for, uh, the census records that they've uh, indexed, and then any church records they've been allowed to um, copy and extract. And so those are all up on my site. Um, I think there's a separate tab for the church records. I'm not sure. It might just be under the Lois and Norwood tab. There's another tab for a man named Doug Shepard, who was just a phenomenal researcher. And um, all the articles he wrote, he was a retired history professor or English professor, um, but just such a super great researcher and did great work. And um, his articles are up there and there's there's a couple hundred of them. So um, we try to get it out there because we really want you know, this information to be there for people. And I understand people can't come here. And so we want to allow them to try to learn what they can from our holdings, um, regardless of where they are. So, um, so, so that's a source that might be of uh, value to you. And then this is just the uh, real quick summary of the types of records that are typically the ones that are requested, which I also sent to your instructor as a handout. So, um, so hopefully she can make that available to anybody who would like as well. So I don't, does anyone have any questions? All right, class, go ahead and unmute your microphone if you have a question. And while I'm waiting for the class to come up with questions, um, there's a couple things I wanted to ask. Um, I made a couple of notes. Um, one is the, the first one is more of a comment than it is a question. You, you had that one slide about the graves indexing table. Um, I just wanted to point out to my class that, you know, you'll frequently find these unique indexing type um, uh, methods. And um, I do have a wonderful link on my website uh, for the class. Uh, if you need help in navigating to that part of the website, uh, because there are many different indexing uh, methodologies. And you're going to encounter many of them in your research. So I just wanted to make a comment on that. And then also, um, Michelle, you mentioned something about rosters on your website. Do you mind like flipping over to your website so we can see your, your website, uh, you know, in real time? Okay. Perfect. Now we can see it. Okay. So here's the um, historian's page. And um, so there's the anti-slavery map, um, the, the historic structure database, our cemeteries, the church records, um, and the, the Barris's tab. So I'm, as I'm speaking, I'm realizing the muster rolls actually that we scanned are on the webpage for the County Historical Society. And I'm also, I'm on their board. So they're actually there, they're not on my site, but they are available. Okay. So it just, as, as you said that, it occurred to me, um, I, I scan records for them as time allows in my department. And so some of the records, if I scan them for them, I send them back to them to put on their website. So the Chautauqua County Historical Society would be another site that would be beneficial to, to check out. But so um, let's see what I have here for church records. So you, these are all just um, downloadable PDFs with whatever information we could get pertaining to that. 
And you mentioned that you were digitizing some of the books as well, some of the publications. Yes. So um, Lois and Norwood Barris gave us permission to uh, digitize anything that they produced in book form for the Genealogical Society. So a lot of these are the books that Lois published. And once again, it's just, you know, a downloadable um, PDF. But, you know, here's like the the burials at the poor farm um, that she had published. So, you know, there's there's a, a ton of information. Um, the church records for the German Methodist Church in Dunkirk. And so these are things you just, you know, you, you just wouldn't be able to find um, as a vital record. That is amazing. I mean, yeah. wow, what a, what a treasure trove that they bequeathed you. Yeah, she, she is, Lois is 95 and she still sits at a microfilm reader at her house and extracts uh, newspapers. Oh my. She's remarkable. Wow. Now you had mentioned the New York State Census records. Mm -hmm. um, do you have them digitized um, for the whole state or just your county? Just our county. Great. So okay. here's, yeah, so here's um, 1855. And they did them, you know, in the order that the enumerator visited, um, but then they created an index for them, you know, so you can, because I think the order is really important, because then you can see who was living by whom. And, um, and then there's an index, or these are just word searchable. So you could just open this and then search for a name. Let's see here. Uh, oh, you mentioned uh, the uh, genealogical uh, society indexing of the poor farm. Um, mm -hmm. Did you show us that? I, I just wrote a note here to look at it. Uh, let's see. That would be under here as well. I'll tell you, the volunteerism in genealogy is just so heartwarming. I mean, what, oh. what people have done with their own volunteer time. It is. And, um, you know, the... <sighs> she she just doesn't stop you know she just keeps um going and it's just amazing oh here's the wait those all right that's the burials how old is your your genealogical uh historical society i mean it sounds like it's been doing work for decades um they were formed i think right around the bicentennial when a lot of other groups were established the the um you know, 17, 1976 okay. bicentennial. And um, it was really, you know, like with the advent of computers that um, Lois and Norwood, you know, just kind of ran with it and um, were using their computer to index things that just nobody had thought of before. And so they're really the ones that were the driving force since the 1980s of getting this stuff done. Amazing. Yeah. Well, what a I'm, treasure trove. I can't believe this. Oh, it is. It is. They're, um, they're I, I just, you know, and I, I feel bad because, um, you know, I'm not sure how many people will step up and, and produce the volume that she has done over the years. Wow. Yeah. So we should, I, all, I just, we should all be so lucky in every one of our communities. <laughs> absolutely. I always feel like when I'm doing my own research and I go to another county, you know, I'm always hopeful that there's a genealogical society that's been active. Um, I, you know, you just never know. Now, Sha, are you familiar with Reclaim the Records? No. Um, they're an organization, um, I believe it is volunteers. I don't think anyone makes any money off of it. It's a, it's a uh, nonprofit situation, um, but you can just type in to your Google search, reclaim the records, and they are really trying hard to get New York state to start releasing uh, more of their record sets to the public. Um, because as you know, I'm sure based on your prior experience, sometimes you have to wait, you know, a year or longer to get a record from New York. And when oh, you're trying yeah. to get into a society or you're trying to publish your family history, I mean, that, that's a really long waiting time. And yes. um, so they've been trying real hard and they've had some success. 
Uh, you could, if you have a chance, you can go look at their website and you'll, you'll read about their success. But they've been doing a lot of really great work on, on trying to get those records released from New York. You know, now that you say that, I think I have heard of it. Um, but I haven't really looked into it, so I'll have to look. But, you know, even, um, you know, Governor Pataki, who was our governor uh, probably, you know, 15 years ago, he sealed all the military discharges. Um, he, you know, he didn't make a cutoff. So like to say like, oh, from World War I and back, they're open. He just did a blanket seal. And so we went from having them available to researchers to not being able to make them available. And it's just very frustrating when things like that happen because, um, you know, we have military discharges going back to the War of 1812 and why in the world wouldn't we want to make those available to people? Absolutely. I so, couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Randall, I see you still got your hand up. Are, are you there, Randall? Yes, I lost you there for a minute and had to get logged back in. Um, I just had an observation uh, when she was talking about New York and uh, the uh, people coming in being called um, displaced people. Uh, it was kind of interesting because I grew up in Chicago and we had a lot of people that came over from Europe in World War II that were not born in the United States. And it brought up a term that I was very familiar with in Chicago. And we called a lot of those people DPs. And all it meant was they were displaced people. And uh, I just thought it was kind of interesting to bring up. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, now, you did mention the anti-slavery map. Is that interactive? Yes, let me see what I can bring up here. So you can just zoom into a community or an area and um, pick, a, pick a spot and it will show you, let's see. Okay. So it'll show you the information that they've compiled about um, whoever was living at that spot or whatever occurred there. So in this case, this is a, a reverend who was one of the signers of a petition. And then they have a picture of the house. Wow. That is, I can't imagine the work that went into this. Oh, yeah. And, you know, there again, it's it's um, volunteers who, you know, took one or two record sources like the anti-slavery petitions, and they just kept, you know, kind of using it to turn up more different sorts of records that you wouldn't necessarily think of, like some of the church petitions. So, um, so yeah, so they've done an amazing job and it and they're just they continue to add to it. Wow. I, I'm just so thrilled in your presentation today. I mean, with just all the information that's available digitally. I mean, bravo for the work you have been doing, Michelle. Oh, well, thanks. We're, you know, we're, we're trying. We, we, because of the records management role I play, we have a, um, you know, an in-house scanning operation with high-speed scanners. And so I've told our local historical societies and even our local cemeteries you know, if you have some old books that are, you know, not backed up or copied anywhere, we'll, when we have time, we'll scan them. And I just feel like so often cemetery records get lost, you know, um, and people have these little treasures and, and it's not usually a huge volume. And so I figure if we can just spend a little bit of time and, and scan it, then we don't have to worry anymore about it getting burned or thrown away or, you know, whatever. So. I couldn't agree with you more. Our library just got last year two high speed scanners and we opened them up to the public for free you know, because we want to encourage the, the public or local societies to come in and preserve their, their information digitally. Oh, that's great. I, so. I love them. I, in fact, I used one this morning um, yeah. to copy some pages out of a book that I needed. So um, technology has changed everything for genealogy. Yes, yes. So I, um, I, I, one thing I really, you know, I love those book cradle scanners. Um, we don't have any, but 
so many things that people have, they don't obviously they, they don't want to cut the books. And so we have to either flop them onto a flatbed scanner or, you know, figure out some other way to copy them. Yeah, ours are the ones that, that do the cradle. So we're very excited about that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, we have <laughs> our library had a major um, redo a couple of years ago. And that was that was part of the budget that was included. So we're very, very thankful for that. That's so, great. Now, class, this is I would just want to give you another opportunity. Do you have any questions? If you do, go ahead and, and unmute your microphone and, and ask Michelle directly. You know, Michelle, I want, while I'm waiting for anybody who might have a question, um, one of the points you brought up is, is so much appreciated that you talked about how, how many of the people came over from other states that surround you to, mm -hmm. to do their marriages, because, you know, I think we've all hit a brick wall where we cannot find the marriage record. And, um, you know, I want to encourage the, the, the class to remember that, you know, those Gretna Greens were the, uh, the, uh, the quick way of, of getting hitched and um, a great way of, uh, if, if the Gretna Green records still exist, to you know, look outside of your local area for that marriage record. Right. And, and then, too, sometimes, you know, if there was um, if there was a follow up, you know, like a letter from a family or whatever, then those are there, too. And I think, you know, you're just probably not going to you might not find that information elsewhere. You know, the fact that somebody may have already had a marriage or been underage or whatever. So, um, and, you know, sometimes um, a family story about when somebody was married isn't exactly right. You know, they're, they may have needed to get married sooner than they wanted their children to know about. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, sometimes just knowing that you can go and find that record, um, you know, is just, just, just more information. Wonderful. Well, it looks like the questions. Um, once again, I'll just give them a few more. Oh, we got another hand up. Richard, go ahead, Richard. I mute your microphone. There it is. Hi. So I'm trying to figure out records for Villanova. One of my ancestors, according to his muster roll from Illinois, was born 1832 in Villanova. Oh. I'm trying to find my Willett family there, other than his father on the census records. Um, I can't find a marriage record for the father, uh, Benjamin, or deeds. Um, I'm just not sure where to look anymore because I was told years ago that uh, Villanova had a fire and they lost all their all their records. Well, I don't know that to be true. Okay. Um, but I do know that that's often told to people by town clerks. <laughs> um, I mean, there wouldn't be a marriage record um, from the 1830s or 40s anyway. Okay. Um, but, you know, if you want to email me with whatever you know, or what you want to find out, I'm, I'm happy to, um, to look into it. And I know the Villanova historian, I believe has had access to some of the town clerk's records, and I can even, you know, include her in trying to help you. Okay, great. Okay. So we'll yeah. Do. Okay. I might not get to it today. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I'm almost I'm almost done for the day. So right? but I'll be back okay. in next week. All right. Thank you, so, Michelle. Sure. Good question, Richard. Anybody else? Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, um, Michelle, I wanted to say thank you for being our guest speaker today. And I know I learned a lot, so I'm sure the class learned a lot as well. And um, like I said, I am awestruck at the, at the wonderful work you've done in, in the collaboration between your local uh, genealogical and historical society uh, to make this all come together so beautifully for those of us who live so far away. Yeah, they get the credit, boy. It's all those volunteers just doing amazing things. And, you know, I hope it was informative and I'm happy to answer questions from anybody if they want to contact me, you know, offline, whatever, I'll, I'll do what I can for you. Yeah, the class has the handout. I sent the, the one that you sent me, I sent it to the class this morning, along okay. with the link for the class today. So uh, everybody has it. So they have a way of getting a hold of you. Uh, and we will be posting this onto our YouTube channel. It might take us a few weeks to get it up and posted uh, through our marketing department, but it will be posted. And once again, Michelle, thank you uh, for everything you've done for us. And thank you for allowing it to be posted to our school YouTube channel. And I will be back in touch with you again soon. Okay, great. Thanks. Take care, right. everyone. Thank you, Michelle. Bye-bye.